All right, so I'm going to be talking about something today that is a pressing issue for a lot of people, whether it's trying to trim down or just feel better. So, and that's food and diet. Now, for about 150 years, diet and nutrition has been a pretty consistent issue for those who wanted to, you know, trim some fat, to look a little leaner, feel healthier and whatnot. There's a fuck ton of different diets. And along with that comes countless questions that tend to drive people crazy. Now, to begin, I want to address the diet component before we delve right into foods and GMOs and whatnot. And so I have one name for you guys. His name is William Banting. He invented the low carb diet in the year 1863 before anything was even fucking, you know, mainstream. And although at the time he said his diet targeted what he called the corpulent people, in today's day and age, we would just call it being overweight. And although many people have come to think that dieting is something of, you know, fairly recent discovery, it really isn't. Ever since human beings have found ways to make their lives easier, in a purely physical sense of the word, they've begun gaining weight, specifically, you know, in the Western Hemisphere more than anything, where innovation tended to progress a lot faster than other countries. William Banting was the first known man to record what we would refer to now as a weight loss plan of sorts. And so he'd become so popular among the heavier types of people or the corpulent type that if you were dieting 150 years ago, one would say that you were Banting, you know, named after him. So Banting himself had lost about 150 pounds in a year by getting rid of bread, butter, milk, sugar, beer, and potatoes completely. However, the diet wasn't widely accepted because back in those days, if you were on the heavier side, it was generally known that it was a sign of wealth and power if you were heavy due to the fact that if you happened to be the opposite, which was, you know, a, a middle to lower class citizen, you couldn't really afford an abundance of food at all. Since then, there really wasn't much innovation uh, in the food and diet field until post-World War I and post-World War II, where body mass index was actually measured and insurance companies began realizing that if you were considered on the heavier side of the BMI scale, body mass index, there was a much more likely chance of you dying younger than the overall medium of, you know, the rest of the population. So more innovation came to the forefront of the subject in the 70s, where guidelines and dietary restriction recommendations began to be implemented by the U.S. government and held, uh, believe it or not, in a congressional library, simply because they noticed the overall increase in obesity and sudden surge of diet pills which the diet pills, I mean, they got pulled from American, Canadian, Mexican markets because of the deadly side effects. It wasn't worth it. But I mean, they noticed people were pretty, you know, getting pretty freaking heavy. So when it comes to what science has backed up as of recently, the two most popular diets, diets have been the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet, which both consist of basic lean meats, limited sugar intake, you know, fruits, vegetables, fish, and, uh, you know, DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And Mediterranean, I mean, it's, it's right in the name, right? Now, I have to mention that when it comes to more mainstream current diets like uh, keto diet, the Whole30 diet, or raw diet, they uh, there do prove to be a lot of benefits scientifically. However, you know, Harvard and Yale studies rank them amongst the bottom five out of the top 35 diets due to the fact that they can lead to nutritional deficiencies, digestive problems, and more serious health concerns. Uh, but people seem to gravitate uh, towards them due to the fact that they tend to provide more immediate results, and that's what a lot of people now obviously are looking for, something not necessarily easy, but quick. If they're going to sacrifice, they want the results quick, right? But they've been scientifically proven that it's not ideal to be on these diets for a very long time. Again, this is up for debate. Everyone's body reacts differently, so I'm not here to say what's right and what's wrong in a very specific sense. But the most pressing question so far would probably be, is the science consistent and are these diets and food-based restrictions even valid? And the answer is that it really depends because everyone's body is different, like I just said. And I can't talk about what underlying medical conditions an older person might have compared to a younger person and whatnot. But like a lot of things, it's all in context of how serious you'll be taking the diet and whether or not exercise is you know, present on a consistent basis as well. Certain diets will work better than others for some, and for others, certain diets uh, may s actually speed up underlying medical conditions that some people, in some cases, didn't even know they had. Now, the needs of individuals are extremely different, and so, unfortunately, there isn't a clear-cut answer with regards to that either. 
However, the best advice anyone can give at this point is to work your way into a diet similar to that. Uh, think about metaphorically of how a pilot lands an airplane, right? Nice and steady. You don't want to you, you don't want to start a fairly strict diet right away without slowly prepping your body. I mean, you're not going to do much for yourself in the sense that you'll shock your body so dramatically that your body may actually refuse to continue with the diet once you've chosen, you know, that you've chosen over a long period of time. And that significantly reverses the progress that you're actually hoping to make. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is it's best to ease into a diet over the course of, you know, one to two weeks. And so you'll be cutting out a ton of unnecessary factors like, you know, cravings, nutritional deficiencies, and so forth that you would have otherwise experienced if you had just fucking pumped into your diet within, you know, the course of 24 or 48 or 72 hours, right? Now, putting aside the idea of specifically selecting a diet and going through the process of creating meal plans and so forth, it's very important to mention that as long as you receive a balanced diet of, you know, meeting certain standards of, you know, macromolecules, micromolecules, we're all going to be deemed healthy if we follow those guidelines generally. And it's more than okay to enjoy yourself once in a while. So someone might ask, what should I do? And to that, I would say, take the facts as you may and implement what you feel would work best for you. And you know what, guys, I wish I could give a direct answer, but there never was and I don't think there ever will be because science is never consistent and there will always be a sort of rotating degree of change in the equilibrium for all people from all different walks of life. So, I mean, putting diet aside now, when it comes to food in and of itself, there's been a shit ton of speculation with regards to, you know, genetically modified organisms or for short GMOs. Now, most people when shopping don't always realize that what they're buying may be genetically modified, and I'm not one to sit here and pretend to be, you know, a full-on expert about it, but there's a substantially large amount of people in the world that oppose GMOs simply because, you know, they've read something on the internet, and for lack of a better phrase, they kind of, you know, plop something out of the internet, and they just read the first thing that they saw, and that was it. When in reality, scientific literature has been pretty inconclusive about this, and there's been no official consensus with regards to how healthy GMOs may or may not be. But what we do know with regards to immediate known facts is that they've been consistently and increasingly positive on a scale that was actually unanticipated by many. Uh, for example, increasing crop yields, you know, helping foods in their early stages gain resistance to crops and chemicals that are not good for them, and actually earn adaptive qualities which would have taken literally thousands of generations to receive through the process of natural adaptation. So, so far they've been proven to be safe. However, there are many misunderstand misunderstandings. I mean, for example, those who believe that improving a plant suddenly makes it a GMO, that couldn't, even, couldn't be farther from the truth. Or those who believe that GMOs cause allergies when they don't at all, these are ridiculous claims. Whoever tells you that is absolutely incorrect. There's no scientific study to back that up whatsoever. However, at the same time, we can't rule out that there's a bigger picture at hand. We have to keep in mind that it's not uncharted for us to state that the overwhelmingly positive results of GMOs may be directly or indirectly contributed to the fact that Monsanto, which is a biotechnology and agricultural company, they're a fucking behemoth, they're huge has a hand in influencing almost every aspect of food processing, production, and distribution. Whether it's controlling what kind of contracts for farmers that farmers receive on a yearly basis to you know patenting seeds and patenting weed-killing herbicides, Monsanto literally has their hand in every aspect of the food chain, which is why you could see there could be a leaning bias towards them. So to think that science may lean in their favor is not an unreasonable argument by any stretch of the word. I mean, you know, sugar companies paid scientists boatloads of money for years to say that, you know, sugar is okay for you and whatnot, right? But here's the thing about everything that I've mentioned and about food processing and GMOs, and I think a lot of people are going to agree with this. It's very important to observe and speculate scientific research and to double look information that's been given to the public. But just as with a lot of other things in life, there is a line and a limit to what we as a human beings can shield ourselves from, right? I mean, we can't put ourselves in a bubble and protect ourselves from every little thing. 
I mean, I like to believe that people understand how to deliberately make good food choices. And many times people make poor choices because it's out of pure laziness, whether they'd like to admit it or not. So whether those vegetables that you, you know, you bought the other day are genetically modified or not, they're still vegetables. And to be completely honest, I'd much rather be concerned about the harm brought to me by, you know, a can of Coca-Cola or Pepsi before some genetically modified corn that I'm going to eat for dinner. Because honestly, that's, it's not just how I feel, but based on the science so far, hasn't really seemed to kill anybody. And if it has, I certainly didn't find it in my extensive research. So, I mean, I think at the end of the day, GMOs, there's nothing really wrong with them. I think so far there's been a lot of benefits. But I'm also not blind to the fact that there could be money involved. So science is leaning one way more than the other. But at the end of the day, it's up to you. I wish I could give a very black and white answer. But, I mean, unfortunately, you know, I can't.